Okay. Hello, online people. Can you hear me? You guys can hear me. Online people, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Emma. Okay, everybody, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this conversation on universal health coverage. So this is part of the Postgraduate Diploma in Health Economics contact block. And so our Postgraduate Diploma in Health Economics has a focus on both the concepts, but also some of the key analytical skills from a health economics perspective that we feel are really important in the movement towards universal health coverage. And we take a particular focus on South Africa, although we hope that our learnings are, are broad enough for all of our students, some of whom are from beyond South Africa. So a very warm welcome to everybody. And we have a, a really great lineup of speakers for this afternoon. And so my name is Sue Cleary. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to have a welcome, firstly, from the Faculty of Health Sciences Deanery. And then I'm going to speak about the NHI bill and universal health coverage and really trying to provide an introduction to the bill and mapping the bill against universal health coverage and then leading into what I consider to be some of the key health economics questions and some of the key public health capacities that we need to start building or enabling as we move forward towards universal health coverage in whatever form that takes. Then we have Gitesh, who is in the room with us, who's going to speak about some of the key themes and inputs on the NHI bill that were made to the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Health, and hopefully also provide us with an update on what exactly was signed on Friday. Didn't have time over the weekend to look at it. And then Mark Fletcher from National Treasury is going to speak about healthcare financing and financing the NHI. Then we've got Beth Engelbrecht to speak about health system governance. And then we've got Vishal Bridgelal to speak about strengthening the bill to move forward on UHC. And then at the end of that, we'll have hopefully quite a bit of time for an engagement with all of you. So you're very welcome. And I'm going to hand over to Colette who is our Deputy Dean for postgraduates. So postgraduates in the room, this is the person to speak to, who's going to welcome. Put me in trouble. <laughs> oh. um, <coughs> thank you very much for inviting me to your symposium. Um, I want to uh, welcome um, all of you on behalf of the faculty. I know some students are doing this course but uh, many of us are coming actually to interface with the NHI and the, the universal health uh, coverage on its own uh, uh, for information's sake. So I would want to thank uh, Sue for the invitation and also the lineup of your uh, your experts, your, your, your stakeholders who are going to be actually speaking to, to you, um, especially to, to the students, you must ask questions. Um, I've uh, read the um, biographies of all these uh, people who are going to speak to you. They have been immensely in the health aspects for a much longer time that you need really to, um, to, to, to ask them questions if there are areas that you, you, you don't understand. Um, this symposium is coming at a very opportune time when we, uh, recently we had the Presidential Health Summit. And uh, one of the things that I've been uh, talking to Sue is that we must actually take one of those elements and start to uh, house it here at UCT and say we are working on this aspect of NHI. So starting to see events like this way, um, even though it's part of teaching, I want it to, if it can grow into part of a, a, a niche area that we will be known to be the experts in, that would be quite um, um, fantastic. I think for, for the rest of us, I think this is a time for us to, um, to understand how the NHI works, and then also to start to see where in the spectrum you can make a contribution, and eventually we should all start then embrace it, as it is something that is coming. I mean, a few years ago we were, we were dreaming it, but now I think it is actually on the horizon and it's coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, everybody.
everybody. So I'm going to move straight into my presentation and I'm going to be hopefully quite quick. So my job is is really just to to try to sort of paint the picture of paint the picture of what we are doing. And uh, I'm just going to wait a second. Cool. OK, here we go. OK, so. Our students already know this, this definition extremely well, um, but what we're talking about in terms of universal health coverage is to provide all individuals and communities with access to the needed promotive, preventive, resuscitative, curative, rehabilitative and palliative health services of sufficient quality to be effective while ensuring that the utilization of these services does not expose users to financial hardship. So that is the UHC universal health coverage notion that I think we are all behind and that we all seek to contribute to. The goals are therefore utilization of services relative to need and the services need to be quality and they need to be delivered in a way that there is financial protection, particularly at the point of service use. So this is another very familiar slide for our students and this comes from Kutzen, who is at the WHO and is called the Pathways to UHC Goals. And what I'm going to try to do is going to use this diagram to map the NHI bill against the pathways so that it hopefully paints the picture of what we're talking about with the NHI bill in a way that's going to set up the other speakers that are going to come after me. So. And what is the national health insurance? Well, it's, it's quite a lot. There's, it's not one thing, there are multiple elements to this reform. So it's a wide ranging reform of the South African health system, including changes to the collection and pooling of revenue, purchasing of health and related services, provision of services, the definition of what the services or benefits are, how they will be chosen, and the roles of different actors in the health system, including the medical schemes, and the provincial departments of health. There's quite a lot in there. So it's not just one thing, it's, a, it's many, many different things. And it basically, this is these are the contents pages that look something like that. And you can go and check it out online. So the question for me is, in what ways does this national health insurance move South Africa closer towards universal health coverage? And I'm gonna to attempt to answer this question by mapping the NHI against the pathways to UHC. So, for the entire system, the first thing is that the users of the system are to be registered with a unique ID, which enables the tracking of care across the entire system. In terms of revenue collection, the health financing arrangements in blue on the left hand side, in terms of revenue collection, there are some options. So, it says that the NHI will be financed by taxation. There is the possibility of the introduction of a new payroll tax or a surcharge on income tax, and that remains to be revealed. In terms of the pooling of that revenue, the idea is that it will be pooled in a single NHI fund, which enables this thing called monopsony power, which means that you have a lot of power as the single purchase of, of services, and um, power in theory to be able to drive down prices. So that's the idea behind monopsony power. The NHI also enables this thing which is quite important to health economics called the purchaser provider split, which means that separate organizations will purchase care from those that deliver care. At the primary health care level, they say that the purchasing will be done by something called the contracting units for primary health care, abbreviated as the CAP or the CUPS. The CUPS are, uh, the idea behind the CUPS is that they will enable services for the registered users that are, have registered via that unique patient ID within a defined geographical area. And geographical areas in my mind are still to be defined, but it could be at the sub-district level, it could be at the district level, or it could be linked to the sort of catchment area of a district hospital. Those are all slightly different things. So a defined geographical area, well, the CUP will purchase in that area for registered services 
and the cups will receive their budget via a risk adjusted capitation formula. Using that budget, that risk adjusted capitation budget, CUPS will then purchase care from accredited public and private providers within that jurisdiction. And in turn, providers will be paid by another capitation. So there are two capitations, at least two capitations in here. So the providers will be paid by capitation payment, but at least in the short run, that will be mixed with other provider payment mechanisms <coughs> such as fee for service or salary. For their registered users, providers will deliver care as defined by the service benefits framework. So that's the benefits package. I think, and if I'm not wrong, um, care in the framework will become a legal entitlement. So that's quite an important aspect. If one, if one wants to achieve equity and affordability and one has a legal entitlement, you have to be quite careful about what you put into the benefit package. It then says that care that is not in the framework can be purchased or provided via medical schemes as a prepayment mechanism or out of, through out-of-pocket payments, I think. So I think that it's okay for me to say that I think because I think that stuff still needs to be revealed. But this is what I have read in the bill in terms of what I think it says. In terms of the intermediate objectives, which is the purple in the middle, um, the first intermediate objective is equity and resource distribu distribution. And that you can see coming through in terms of the risk adjusted capitation formula, which determines the budgets for the cup. And equity is coming in there in that variable such as sparsity, sex, age, um, people living with HIV and premature mortality can be modeled to adjust the formula up or down, depending on these measures of equity. So equity coming through in terms of the way the budget flows to the cups. <coughs> Efficiency, on the other hand, can be promoted in a variety of ways. So the one is that the benefits, if they're cost effective, that will promote efficiency, where efficiency is simply the maximization of outcomes within a particular resource envelope. So that's what efficiency means. Um, there's also a big drive in terms of choosing a cost effective provider via the national referral policy. And the idea is that for a particular um, for a particular treatment or care, um, that it, it it must be the case that that is provided by almost the lowest level provider, so a community health worker or nurse before it's a doctor. And then the other efficiency mechanism is in the way the provider payment mechanisms will be structured. In terms of transparency, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways that transparency and accountability can be promoted, but a couple of them are that there should be health technology assessment in the choice of the benefits, and that is said to promote transparency quite strongly. But in addition, there will be a lot of data that can be analysed for monitoring and evaluation to manage waste, corruption and misuse of resources. <coughs> in terms of utilisation relative to need, which I would say is your main equity goal contained within universal health coverage, this is to be enabled via legal entitlement to access care as defined in the service benefits framework. Quality via processes to accredited providers and incentives within the provider payment mechanisms and universal financial protection via the removal of all user fees. In the South African public health system, we um, only have fees for certain means tested individuals at the hospital level. Those will also be removed. All of the above is to be enabled by the collection and timely use of a variety of data in health systems governance. And I think as Beth will explain to us, underpinned by an enabling organizational culture with distributed relational leadership, absolutely essential. Okay, so that was my first set of diagrams. It's quite a lot. So I've developed another set of diagrams to try and break it down a bit more for you. So this is my diagram of what is the primary health care level of the NHI. And this is my little depiction of the contracting unit for primary health care services. And this circle is this defined geographical area, which in my opinion is yet to be defined. And I do not think should be a one size fits all. I do not think that every sub district in the country should have a cup. 
maybe it needs to be some some dist sub districts and some districts but the circle is this defined geographical population that contains a range of different kinds of providers so there are dentists there are pharmacists there are psychologists there are community health workers there are health facilities and hospitals and nurses and vaccines and drugs and okay so in terms of a defined package of benefits and defined providers somebody online is playing us music oh thank you then um the, here's the nhi fund office and you've got this idea of the risk adjusted capitation funding which i think we could maybe imagine to be a bit like the budget that comes into the cup with information bi-directional information systems okay so that's the depiction so the cups are to purchase care on behalf of this defined geographical population of registered users and the care is defined as per the service benefits framework the providers include a wide range of different organizations, including provincial governments, municipalities. In Cape Town, municipalities are involved in the provision of certain primary care services, private providers, and non governmental organizations. So, these are some of the questions that are coming through for me at this stage. So, we've got the service benefits framework. We know that that's a legal entitlement. So, the questions include. How will the cost effectiveness of the service benefits framework be assessed? How will we monitor equity and access? How will these decisions be made and how will that be made transparent? Who or what entity will work out what the healthcare needs are of that local area or particular population of users? And in what way? I think that this is quite important. So for me, NHI is almost like a one size fits all, but we know that local areas have different needs. So in what ways should the local variation in service benefits be enabled to meet local needs? And how does this work if there are legal entitlements? In terms of budget and affordability, a key question is, will the capitation funding be enough to afford the service benefits framework? given that these are legal entitlements. In terms of provider payment mechanisms, what will be the actual mix? And how will that differ over time? How will that differ between different contexts? Uh, and how will that then sort of be enabled during implementation? Is there a risk of a gap between the budget to the cup versus the payments to providers? I think yes, but in what way will that then be managed or mitigated? What risk do contracted providers bear? I think potentially quite a bit of risk. Whether paid via salary, fee for service or capitation, what happens if resource or other constraints limits provision of the benefits if they are a legal entitlement? In terms of the use of data in decision making for benefits, how will this information be used to promote equity and affordability, to evaluate the service benefits, and to, to determine investments and disinvestments from service benefits in an explicit way. In terms of the use of data and in monitoring and evaluation of financial flows, how will information be used to monitor provider, provider payments and to detect fraud, waste <coughs> or inappropriate spending? OK, so that's sort of my attempt at providing an overview of something that is very, very complex and I think that we are all sort of grappling to understand it at the moment, and so I may not be 100% correct about all of this, but that's my attempt to map it. And so given that, and given the vision that we have as we move towards universal health coverage, and I would say irrespective of how it turns out in the end, these are some of the capacities that I think that we need, and that I think that we should be seeking as academics across the HEIs to enable. So I'm going to call the first one health system economists. So this is all quite interdisciplinary. So there's this sort of more straightforward health economics tools like budgeting and planning, economic evaluation and health economic modeling. But there's also ethics and priority setting. There's issues of healthcare financing, provider payment mechanism design and monitoring progress to universal health coverage. In terms of broader public health capacity, so we are part of a school of public health. Um, we like this term of interdisciplinary public health scientists and leaders. So we're seeking real capacity strengthening in the health system governance, management and leadership 
health policy development and analysis, epi biostats and health data science, burden of disease and demographic modeling, health economics, as already said, social and behavioral sciences, environmental health, and more. And that's just from the public health perspective. Obviously, there's much more needed from the broader health community and beyond. So that's the end of my input. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to move to Gitesh. <clears throat> Thanks, Sue. So, Professor Kier has kind of given you the, the technical components of NHI and how it's going to get us to UHC. And I'm sure on, the, the, on paper, this the, the WHO endorsed model and everybody's it makes a lot of sort of sense in terms of what, what's been put on paper. But major financial reforms, such as the NHI, are technical solutions which need to be adopted to meet the requirements of the environment they've been implemented. I think it's important as the first point. And the second one, and the more important one, is that they challenge the status quo. They threaten vested interest groups and inevitably become highly contested. So, so the issue is you can have a technical solution, but there's a politics around the implementation and the, and the kind of the strategy around it, which one needs to consider. And one questions whether that's been fully considered in the South African context. And that's the question I want to kind of raise in this presentation. So the Portfolio Committee on Health is the, the committee that kind of oversees the, the NHI bill in South Africa, has approved an amended draft of the bill on the 23rd of May, which is over the weekend. But there remains high levels of contestation and concerns as to whether the NHI is the correct strategy for delivering UHC. So on paper, we've got the strategy which makes absolute rational sense of saying this is what, what the issues are. This is what we want to get to in terms of UHC and this is NHI and the strategy for getting it. The question is whether one, so, so people have raised a lot of questions around it. And the question is whether one agrees with those questions or not. If NHI is going to be implemented, we have to start thinking about some of the concerns and, and making a call as to whether those concerns are valid. And if they are valid, then how, do, how does one adapt our implementation strategy going forward in, to, to accommodate those concerns? Okay. So the, the NHI is not something that, that happened immediately. I mean, it was almost a, a, in our post-revolutionary zeal. In fact, the discussion started before 1994 and we the issue was we've got a two-tiered healthcare system and we want to change this healthcare system and the discussions around NHI started. And all along, it took almost 30 years for us to get to the NHI bill. And all along that way, there were kind of various permutations of what the strategy we're going to adopt. And there's, along the way, there's contestation in terms of what, what is cheese that we want to do and how, how do we want to get there. But the focus for, for now is that the bill got passed in 2019 and subsequent, and that's kind of the latest plan that's been put on the table. And now the question is, well, we went through a process of the Portfolio Committee on Health, once the bill is passed, then is mandated to get public input on the bill to see what the concerns are around the bill. They then assess those inputs and based on the inputs must then revise the bill. To, to accommodate some of the concerns that have been raised. So this, it's a very public process. So basically from the, the bill got published in 2019, 2019 20, up to 2021, the, the portfolio committee went all over the country and had what they call town hall meetings where people were invited to come and say what they, what they thought about the bill. People were invited to, to submit written, make written submissions. And then they were, they invited to come and make oral representations to the committee, um, which, were, which were public as well. Right? And then 2022, 2023, they deliberated on the bill. And then finally, on the 23rd of May, now this, the amended bill has been approved. Right? So, so the, the public process in South Africa actually gives you an opportunity to look at what people raise around the bill and what the issues are. So, the bill in South Africa had 
and no other legislation in South Africa since 1994 had the kind of public interest that uh, NHI 12 generated. So there were over 100,000 written submissions. 130 organizations requested to present to the NHI and uh, to the Portfolio Committee, and 117 presentations took place over a period from 18th May to uh, 2021 to the 23rd of February 2022. So what we did was we said, let's put all of this, and all of this information is publicly available. And we analyzed this information that's available to kind of look at what the concerns are, because ultimately, as I said, you can have a, a technical solution. You can, people have expressed countrywide concerns around this technical solution. If it gets implemented, it doesn't mean those concerns disappear. One needs to kind of almost take into account to say, are these concerns valid or not? And if they're valid, how does one in going forward accommodate some of those concerns? Huh? So just to give you context again, I'm just giving you the, the details of what the NHI proposal is about, but just to kind of again put everything into context to see where, and you'll see there's concerns along all the pieces that come along. Huh? So the issue we're trying to deal with in this country is that we've got a two-tiered system. We've got a public system and a private system. And broadly, the, 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 the difficulty with the two-tiered system is that 50%, you know, these are not exact percentages that we're talking kind of ballpark, that 50% of the resources that we spend in the country as a whole are spent on 80% of the population, and the other 50% are spent on 20% of the population. So you can understand the inequities. I mean, there's a small group of people that are spending a hell of a lot, and the rest are getting very little. So you've got this inequitable system between the public and the private system. So what is the NHI trying to do? So the NHI says, let's take all the money that's there in the public system and the private system and put it into one pool. Right? So we've got one common pool. And the rationale for that is to say, if you have public, so remember what happens in the private sector, that 50% of the money you have no control is basically sits with the private sector, with the medical schemes and the administrators and so on. So you have no control, public control over that 50% of the resources. If you put all that money into one public pool, you, the government then can control that resources and where it's going to go. Right? So basically public control resources will provide the means for greater public control over the health financing of the country. So essentially we'll control 100% of the financing of the country as opposed to just 50%, and that's the government. Right? And what does this allow? It allows for integration of the healthcare system because you've got one funder, you can then decide how the, 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 the funding gets allocated between the public providers and the, and the private providers. It allows you to cross subsidize, right, and address the equity issue. So if all the money is in one pool, you, it gets distributed to the entire population. So essentially, it allows you to cross subsidize from those who are currently paying more to those who are paying less. So effectively, if you've got everybody contributes into one pool, you, you can address the equity issues that, that currently play the system. And then thirdly, because you've got concentrated buying power, you've got all the money in one pool, you can decide where that money goes. The private sector and the competitions commission kind of made quite clear how inefficient the system is currently in terms of the private sector and how we buy care. What you do here is if you then get the economists, you can have your health technology agencies and everything else, and you can rationally decide where that money goes. You, you, you cut out all the inappropriate care and the inefficiencies in the system, right? So how are you going to move this money from the private to the public? And essentially, the, the proposals are to do two things. So currently, if you belong to the medical aid in this country, you get a tax subsidy, right? So what the, the, the NHI bill essentially doesn't specify, but I mean, this is the kind of the, 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 the arguments that have been made around it, is that the medical aid tech subsidies will get removed. So that's a fairly small portion. And then the rest of it will be through increasing your taxes. So people who are currently working, everybody is working or earning an income. So the unemployed won't, but everybody else will be, then have to pay more in taxes to, to, to contribute. So what happens is currently, let's say you're paying 100 rands towards medical aid. That 100 rands will be taxed and go into the public pool, into the NHI pool, but you won't have to pay your private medical aid anymore because everything is going to go into one pool. You're with me? Yeah. So 
effectively what you got then is a redistribution. So what I've done here is just to give you an illustration of what we're talking about and why this has become such a contested issue. Right? You know, and that's why I said NHI or financing reforms are, are politically contested. So currently, so let's say we had 100 rains in healthcare funding and we had 100 people that we had to provide this care for. Right? So currently we've got in the public sector 50 rains Remember, it's split 50-50, so we've got 50 rands that's going to the public sector. And we've got 80 people that are dependent on the public sector. So the per capita, the per head expenditure that we have is 63 cents per head. The private sector, has got, we've got 50 rands that's going into the private sector, because remember the, the, the costs in the country are split 50-50. But there's only 20 people there, so they get, they're spending 2 rand 50 per head. Right? So you've got... 63 cents for the public sector people, depending on the public sector, and you've got 250 on people who are dependent on the, on the public sector or private sector. What you do with NHI is we pool all this money together. So you've got 100 rents, and you've got 100 people not dependent on it. So you basically got one rent per person. So effectively, the net gain and loss, and that this is essentially your 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 cross subsidization is going to happen. Right? So basically, people who are dependent on the public sector gain, because now they're going to get one rent per head, effectively. They're gaining about 38 cents per head. And those that are in the private sector now will pay the same, but they'll be getting, in terms of benefits or expenditure, 250 less, or 150 less. Instead of getting 250, they're getting one day. And that's the nub of the thing. That when you ask people to redistribute, there's an implication, and those who lose out are going to fight the system. But right? I mean, that's I mean that that's politics and and how things unfold. Whenever you you threaten someone's vested interest, and this is the kind of the core in terms of financial reforms. I mean, I'm sure, most of the people here are middle class, and so this is I mean the issue that's at stake is that you're going to end up paying the same more or less, or maybe even more, but you're going to get less. And that's why people are fighting. So that's the, you're pooling the resources. You're going to put this NHI, all this money, you're going to create what they call a board. So like the medical schemes in this country, we'll have a board of trustees with a CEO and committees, various committees. And all of these, the, the, the board, so, so basically the board is essentially you'll have a group of people that will make decisions of how this money gets spent. Right? And then you have a CEO who kind of is the, chief executive, and then they'll have various committees to look at various things of the NHI fund. But the key thing that, that people are concerned about is that the Minister of Health has a lot of control over who gets appointed. Every decision that gets made has to go back to the, to the Minister of Health. And that's kind of a big area of contestation around the world. So it's not an independent board. If you, the Minister of Health decides who sits on the board, and then they have to report to the Minister then it's not an independent board. And that's a big issue around the, the particular poll that South Africa got. The next two are, as Sue pointed out, <clears throat> that the NHI bill, as it's been proposed in this country, will be the single purchaser and the single per, kind of payer for healthcare services. So whatever the NHI says, listen, we are not covering optical benefits. Nobody else can insure for optical benefits. Only the NHI would be able to. So you, you can't then go and insure for optical benefits privately. If the NHI is covering that particular benefit, then basically they're the only player in game, the only player in town, right? So and that's contestation, and you'll see what the contestation around that is. With. Can, can you then... So effectively, the, the role of other funders, private funders, will effectively disappear. And your choice of funders disappears as well. So as an individual, if right now you have, you can make a choice as to which funder you want to go to, but in terms of the NHI, you lose that, as an individual, you would lose that, the right to go and choose which funder you want to, to use. The, the next area of contestation is around, so, so basically the NHI will be the only player in game in town in terms of the benefit it decides to cover. And then it will provide these benefits through accredited providers. So there'll be an accreditation system. So if you're a hospital or a general practitioner, dentist, you're going to be accredited by the NHI fund in order to provide services to people. If you're not accredited, basically you're out of business because everything will be covered via the NHI. And if you 
people can't pay for you, pay cash for your service, then effectively you're out of business. And that's kind of another area of contestation. No? And then they'll buy the services from <laughs> primary health care hospital and EMS, and I think Sue's kind of covered some of that. Right? So what were the kind of the concerns? So, so as I said, coming back, I mean, if you're going to go ahead with NHI, is the concerns raised, and there might be vested interest in terms of people raising these concerns, but ultimately they are concerns. And the public, broad section of the public will present, I mean, it is a wide cross section of South African society that expressed <coughs> concerns at the year. So these concerns are there, whether we now implement or not, those concerns are there. You must decide, I mean, as you sit here, whether you think it's a valid concern or not. And I'm going to take you through kind of the six big concerns that, pe that people have raised around the NHI board. Right? So the first one is around the constitutionality of some of the provisions in the board. Right? So as I said, the, the NHI board says uh, it will be the single payer, single purchase of services for the services that it covers. Right? So board designates NHI as a single payer, single purchase of health services. It will be unlawful to provide for or purchase services covered by NHI outside of the NHI. So NHI for the services it covers is the only game in town. Now in the South African constitution, we have, and this might differ in other countries, but I mean generally it's kind of a general principle, right? So in the South African constitution, we have what they call the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights is that you have a right to access healthcare services. So everybody in this, every citizen in this country has a right to access healthcare services. Every citizen in this country, not only citizen, any person that's in the country has a right to healthcare services. They have a right to a profession. It means the ability to be able to work and the freedom to work and choose what work you want to do. And then the last portion is the provincial responsibilities. And it's linked to the Bill of Rights because the provinces in this country, the way that law is written, is that the provinces are mandated to ensure that the right of access to health services for individuals is promoted. Right? And people are concerned, so, so essentially what they're saying is by, by implementing the single purchase of single provider, you you limiting all of you, you in fact, contravening these constitutional imperatives. And people have kind of raised questions as to whether it's constitutionally fine to do, right? Because they're saying you, you, you're going to restrict right to access, you're going to restrict the right to choose professions. And the provinces have argued, at least the Western Cape has argued, and Dr. Balabji is here, and I'm sure he's one of those that drafted that objection, that um, basically you, you're impinging on the province's ability to, to deliver on, the, on people's right to health care. Right? Uh, the second area constitutional issue around the bill was around the rule of law. So, so basically, the, all countries have a rule of law, so you've got to abide by the law. And the legislation that, that we pass in a country has to be very clear and unambiguous so, and precise so that it can be interpreted. So when, when people go to the law, they know exactly what is being said, what you can do, what you can't do. The argument here is that the so remember, this thing went through multiple iterations over 30 years. There were lots of different people that worked in the bill over the period of time. And what you ended up is almost a, a, a piece of legislation by committee. So different people worked at, at different times. They had different focuses. And, and what people have argued is that the bill, as it's written, is very poorly written because it doesn't provide a clear set of guidelines in terms of what's going to happen. So what it does is open up uh, I mean, essentially, contestation down the line. So you pass the bill, but people will keep challenging different pieces because the law isn't quite clear as to what is allowed and what is not allowed. Yeah. Um, and then the last one was asylum seekers. So basically, the bill for anybody who's not South African or for refugees and others, the, the NHI bill basically restricts the right of uh, of their rights to health care, and that's in contravention both of the South African constitution as well as the commitments that South Africa has made for in other international bodies in terms of looking after people that come to the country. So the, the constitutional question, I mean, is the, so the portfolio committee then <clears throat> in its deliberations says, listen, people have raised all these concerns around the legality of the bill, and they asked then the state lawyers to, to look at it. And there's two sets of state lawyers that, that look at it. The first is the parliamentary advisors, 
And then the second one is the state law advisors, right? There's two, so two, two within parliament that kind of work. And they gave contradictory opinions. So the one said, hey, listen, you've got problems with this bill. And then the other one said, no, it's all fine. You can go ahead with the bill. And that tells you kind of upfront that there's going to be issues. I mean, so if, if parliamentary legal people, one part of it tells you, listen, there's an issue. There's going to be legal issues around the bill, right? Okay, so that's the constitutional concerns. I'm going to now go to the funding concerns, and I'm going to go through it quite quickly. So essentially, people have said there isn't enough detail in the in the bill on how the funds will be raised. So I talked about the taxation, but those are discussions on the side. They weren't necessarily in the bill. Um, second question was the increased taxation was unaffordable or unsustainable. So again, you know the economy of the country and what's going on. And the question is, if you're going to raise taxes, for those that are working, your tax base is reducing, there's economic impacts of, of increased taxation. And if you want to increase tax, do you want to do it for healthcare or do you want to do it for electricity? Right? I mean, it's, so, so those are the kind of questions people are asking as to whether that would be. Um, the third one is the public funding model would not work in South Africa. So remember, we've got a wider context of what's going on in this country and I'll pick up on the corruption concerns and so on. But basically people are saying, in this environment that South Africa is in currently, do you really want to put a whole lot of money into the NHI fund, which is controlled by few people, reporting to the minister? That's, that's a, kind of a question. Um, there's lack of clarity as to how the funding will flow to providers, and it's another concern that people have. So again, remember this, Sue talked a bit about COOP and the provinces, and it's not quite clear in the funding as to how the money will actually go to the provinces, how it will go to the districts, whether it will go through coops and so on, there's a lack of clarity. And then lastly, people said, listen, NHI is one strategy for bringing money together. There are other models in the world that are operating. This is not the only way of doing it. Then maybe you should look at the other models as well. Yeah. Uh, on corruption, I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to go through kind of the details, but I mean, essentially, you know the story about corruption in this country. And the, the central argument there is, if you've got this really corrupt environment, do you really want to put all this money into one pool and give it to control to this board of small group of people to, to be running this money? And that's, I mean, the fundamental question. Right? The reports to the minister of how. So there's a whole host of concerns, and the people said, you know, you don't have enough governance proper governance structures in place, um, you don't have the safeguards in place in terms of the legislation, and is this really what you want to be doing? So in terms of suggestions, some people say, hey, listen, until you sort out corruption, you can't even think about NHI. And then others said, no, but you can put in additional mechanisms to deal with the corruption and you can try and manage it. But better, and people made broad recommendations and they made specific recommendations. Not going to go through that now, but at least you get a flavor of, of what people had to say. Then, as I said, there was lots of concerns around the governance and the role of the Minister of Health. So essentially, the bill gives, is mentioned 123 times in this in the NHR bill, and, and it's all linked to the Minister will do this, the Minister will provide the um, so you've got to report to the minister. The minister will appoint everybody. So everything ultimately hangs with the minister, and there's like lots of concerns as to whether that's the right governance model that we should be going from. As I said, there were issues around access. So the asylum seekers, there was a big concern. There's, so the poll makes, there's a specific registration process that, that one has to follow in terms of registering for the NHI. And people raise questions as to how that will affect uh, access to healthcare because um, it was quite onerous in terms of documentation and everything else. The use of accredited providers is a concern. Then people said, you know, if you if you start limiting where we can go to, I mean, it will restrict access and there's conflicts with the patient's uh, rights charter that we currently have in the country as well. And then there's lots of lobbying. People are very keen on lobbying. So, so the dentists ask for more benefits or preferential access, et cetera, et cetera. And that will come through again when, when the poll passes. Right? On benefits, there's quick questions as well. So Sue's kind of talked about it, but the poll is very unclear. I mean, so basically what the poll said is the benefits advisory committee in consultation with the Minister of Health and the board will determine the benefits. But it doesn't say what's included, what's excluded, 
doesn't say what process will be used to determine the thing. And people then question is to, if you can't tell us what you're going to offer, and you're not telling us how you're going to decide what's going to be offered, it's, it's seriously problematic, right? So there again, there were recommendations. So in conclusion, then, I mean, the portfolio committee is approved very much along party political lines and a list of amendments. So the, the A list is basically, here's our the original bill. The A list says these are the things that we've changed. And basically the amendments, despite all the inputs that have come through, are, are like un insubstantive. I mean, there hasn't been really changes. Huh? So there's a high probability of legal challenges to the bill, but it's difficult. I mean, I'm not a legal person and I can't tell you whether the legal challenges are going to succeed or not. So there's a potentially flawed bill. I mean, so there's a it might be a potentially flawed bill that gets passed, or it might get sent back to the drawing board if the, the legal challenges come through. So the question then is, given the uncertainty, how do we proceed? I mean, and this is a question that kind of, I guess, people here that are working from the health services and academics and, and society as a whole that we need to kind of confront, right? So first option is we just say, like, let's wait for the outcome of the constitutional challenges. We'll continue with the status quo and do nothing different. And that's what we've done for the last 40 years. I mean, we've waited for NHI and we've, there have been movements and we've done things, but by and large, NHI has actually stopped a lot of other developments from taking place. So there's always been this thing, oh, NHI is coming, NHI is coming, so let's not do anything. So that's kind of the first model and we can just continue for that. The second one would be to say, let's assume the NHI will be sent back to the drawing board. That means basically the, the, the courts are going to say this thing is fundamentally flawed. That means we start that whole process again. Okay? We're going to have to kind of like go back almost to 40 years back and say, okay, what is our strategy now for dealing with the, with the, with the issues that we've got in the country? And then the question is, well, how can we improve the system? And that's kind of the second. And the last one is you assume that, okay, the bill will be approved. Then the question is, well, if the bill is going to be approved, what do we start doing to start getting ready? And Sue's kind of talked about some of it, but we need to then start planning and putting in place the changes that we need to make in order to, assuming that NHI is going to be implemented. And more importantly, how are we going to address some of the concerns that are inherent in the NHI bill as it currently states? Yeah. Thank you. So thank you very much to Gitesh. Um, I think that this analysis of the of these inputs to Parliament has been extremely valuable, and I'm so grateful that you're coming and helping us to understand it. Thank you very much. So, Mark, are you online? I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can so you now, see me? Are you able to share? I can see you. There you are. Um, do you want to share from your side or do you want me to share? I think if you could share, then you can move your slides on. Okay, let me can do that. Okay, do you see this? Yes, just put it into, yeah, there you go. Okay, um, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, um, I wish I could see more of you. I can kind of see a bit of my own screen. Um, I can see some of your names. So I, I know some of you, but not all of you, but I can't see the people who are in the venue. So you know, afternoon to everybody. And uh, very difficult to squeeze five such major presentations all into one afternoon. Um, ah, nice to see the colleagues there. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about some of the, so I work in the National Treasury, and I'm going to talk some about some of the numbers aspects of this, and some, perhaps some Treasury perspectives of some of some of these, these issues. So I'll talk a little bit about health, the health financing landscape in South Africa, some current constraints on health budgets since COVID, uh, put these in the context of the economy and the fiscal and uh, expenditure choices and pressures we have, talk a bit about some expenditure comparisons and then bring it a bit more back to NHI and its financing and some of the cost estimates and revenue options. All right, so then this next slide, if colleagues can see it, 
it, I'm going to show you a series of numbers on spending. So the, this slide, this slide is from what's called the national health accounts. And it, in many countries, the national health accounts is supposed to be the most detailed and accurate portrayal of the detail of health spending in the country. And for South Africa, the, the health accounts is coordinated by the National Department of Health. Our last published health accounts is in 2021, but it only covers the year up to 2016-17. So our health accounts are very far behind. Um, and what you can see on the screen is 14, 15, 15, 16, and 16, 17. And the top blue, uh, blue bar here in 16-17 shows that 98% of our financing is domestic. Only 2% is coming from donors like PEPFAR and the Global Fund. And on these last two axes here, you can see in the way also that Gitesh described this, this, this kind of 50-50 split or 46-49 splits between pu public and private, particularly between the provinces and the medical schemes, um, which characterizes our very tiered um, um, health financing system. Now, a bit more numbers from a second source. So this is the latest World Health um, Financing data for South Africa. They publish every December, and this is from um, December 2022. And you can see that they're saying current health expenditure um, as a percent of GDP is around 8.6% of GDP. You see it going up in COVID. Um, you can see domestic, which is mainly government health expenditure, what in, in WHO abbreviates called GGHED, um, going from 270 to 290 um, billion rand a year. That's in NCU, that's in South African rands. And here you see them showing private health expenditure as about 180, 170 billion. So public being quite uh, a bit higher than, than, than private in the WHO numbers. And the reason for this, which is shown at the lower part of the table, is that WHO classifies government support for medical schemes like GEMS, which is the big government medical scheme, and tax subsidies for private medical insurance. They classify that as, as public health expenditure, which is a bit different to the way do, they do it. Um, so that they then report South Africa's public expenditure is about 5.3% of GDP, 15.3% of government spending. Um, and you'll see some other measures here. Out-of-pocket spending, relatively low in South Africa. Okay, this is very detailed. You probably can't see the numbers, but um, probably the most detailed uh, or up-to-date source of funding we actually keep in the National Treasury. We update these numbers very regularly. And you can see in the last financial year, about 22, 23, about 242 billion Rand being spent in provincial departments of health and about 237 billion being spent in medical schemes. But it's quite likely, if you look at this going forward, that medical schemes are gonna be spending more than provincial departments of health over the next three years, as the public budget is very constrained at the moment, which is something that I'll come back to. I'm not gonna go look at all these other financing streams because we just don't have enough time now. But here you see these big two envelopes within the public sector, the big one being the provincial health departments, the nine provincial health departments, some other bits and pieces. And in the private sector, the big one being the medical schemes and some other bits and pieces, some different estimates of out-of-pocket expenditure. That's a relatively high estimate. And if anyone wants a simple formula of how you um, can compare government health expenditure, it's a product of uh, GDP, um, um, government overall expenditure as a share of GDP and government health expenditure as a percentage of, of, of government expenditure. And um, from where we sit in the Treasury, issues to do with economic growth linked to the GDP, issues to do with tax policy and administration deal with this tax to GDP ratio, issues to do with fiscal policy deal with um, the general government uh, the difference between how much um, one spends more than one gets in in revenue and um, expenditure policy deals with how you're allocating between the different departments. Now, the, perhaps the big problem that we face in South Africa, which really affects all the votes or with all the budget votes of all the departments, is that effectively, if you look at if you look at GDP, economic growth, um, 
per capita, given the population grows every single year, adjusted by inflation, is that South Africa has effectively been in a low growth trap since 2008. So that we've got real per capita GDP declining since 2008. And the problem when the economy is, is a long cycle of decline of, of 15 years or so, it's, it's very difficult not just to grow health, but to grow anything. So you see um, non-interest government overall expenditure following this down, down path. This, this graph on the figure on the right is the Stats South Africa quarterly GDP numbers. And you can see this was the biggest, COVID was the biggest global recession in about a century. And we're still just coming back now to the pre-COVID numbers about three years later and population has grown, et cetera, since then. And in this period where COVID happened, government took on a lot of debt. So the interest payment on the right here that government pays on debt is starting to reach about 20% of the budget. So it's squeezing out a health expenditure, squeezing out a lot of things. Government is spending almost 400 billion a year now just paying interest payments. And we've seen countries like Zambia, Ghana, um, Sri Lanka and others into quite big debt um, crises and having to be bailed out over the, the last year or two. And what we've also seen quite, um, what we've seen, I mean, I'm speaking from the Treasury here also, here just kind of just is, is, is you know, though one talks about the importance of health, we've seen many, many competing pressures starting to be, to, to come forward, with people coming with very strong demands for competing budget bids. So this interest payments on debt, as I say, is now take is now we now spend more on health or any other government department on what we pay towards debt. Uh, we have all these constant power cuts, and they always demands them to put money into ESCOM. The huge income losses during COVID led to the the initiation of new social um, income protection measures like the 350 grant, which goes to about eight million people every month and new programs, public works programs for 32% of the population are unemployed. We had students um, uh, uh, striking around fees must fall, which led to almost a 50% increase in higher education budgets. We have cholera and a lot of demands for increasing budgets for free basic services and the local government equitable share. A lot of needs to put infrastructure in place. So the problem is that NHI does not sit alone. There are a lot of calls on government spending. And um, this, this slide just shows uh, five or six measures of the percentage of the budget that goes to health. Um, because of time considerations, I won't go through all these measures, but um, South Africa fares not too badly. On average, about 13% of government spending goes to health. Um, in general, it's better to look at um, ratios in which the denominator excludes government interest, because otherwise the the outcome gets quite um, dominated by this, these rising interest payments. And these are just some of the, the areas where we're budgeting this year. I won't go into this. And this again shows health's share of overall government expenditure. It's, you know, not varying that much, actually. But now this is a, a slide of quite a lot of concern, is that provincial health budgets um, this year are, are, and over this next three years are under huge pressure. So when you look at the provincial health budgets per capita, it includes the Western Cape budget, all the other budgets, um, the, the, red, the blue line is the nominal budgets and the orange line is adjusted for inflation. And you see the small peak for COVID, but then a fairly strong decline into 2023, and this is of great concern, um, even after these quite a number of years of increases. And there are large pressures on the public spending side um, at, at the moment. And they come from the economic declines and borrowing during COVID, this huge recession, which lead to uh, a lot of increase in debt problems. Um, and that subsequently led to cuts in the budget in, in, in budget 21 after increases in budget 2020 when COVID was in its peak. A particular problem we have right now is the very large government wage increase that was recently negotiated with the trade unions is going to cost about 35 billion, nearly 9 billion for health. And it's currently unfunded. 
that's a, an extremely serious problem right now as we speak, and some kind of prob some kind of solution needs to be found to this. There are big problems uh, of what are called the cruels in some of the provinces, which are uh, spending in one year where the province didn't have the funds, and then, then those uh, those bills are, are pushed through to the new year. There's quite big backlogs and in, in lo- increasing amounts of medical legal claims. There are big backlogs in health infrastructure, inflationary pressures, and there are the pressures in the fiscal framework that I talked to. Now, these two slides compare South Africa with some other upper middle income countries. And, um, you know, we often think that health is not so well funded in South Africa. But when you compare to upper middle income countries on a, um, a government health expenditure per capita US dollar basis, South Africa is actually not too bad. Here we are on the upper graph, and that's compared to upper middle income countries. Um, and when you compare to, um, this is as a, sh- that's per capita US dollars, this is as a share of government expenditure. And again, South Africa is, you know, maybe in the upper third. So South Africa is not that bad comparatively. And looking in the African region in terms of those two variables, spending per capita US dollars and as a share of the budget, South Africa is normally in the top three. In fact, in these graphs, it's the top country in Africa on both those variables. I think if you take out some of the um, things like GEMS and so on, I think countries like Mauritius may actually have overtaken South Africa now. I think South Africa may actually be third in Africa on a per capita basis. I need to check the latest numbers. Now, let me let me let me come to national health insurance now. So it is obviously a, a massive shift in how health is financed. Uh, Gishtesh talked a lot about the bill. It's been it's been um, given the go ahead by the Portfolio Committee in, on Health, but it still needs to be. Sorry, this is incorrect. It hasn't been. It still needs to go to the National Assembly. And after that, it needs to go to the NCOP, which is the provincial house. And it will be interesting to see what the provinces make of it in the in the NCOP. So it is seeks to establish this public entity, which is the NHI fund, and gradually increase public financing's share of total expenditure. The link between current budgets and performance in the health sector is weak, and so it's aims through strategic purchasing and also through reimbursement change. Gitesh talked about capitation, but also DRG payments in hospitals and other arrangements to try to strengthen that performance. Um, I'll come back to costs and spending, but to say the likely time frame for rollout continues to be more medium to long term rather than short term. So these um, UHC and NHR reforms are important, very important in principle, but Gitesh's point is correct that there are many different models of universal healthcare globally. South Africa's health financing system is very fragmented and inequitable, and one does need to build something between the public and private medical schemes models. Um, it's quite common internationally to see this model of large public scheme or schemes buying from a mix of public and private providers, and there isn't probably a strong need to introduce strategic purchasing in our context. Some of the private healthcare costs are very expensive, and one needs mechanisms to improve access, control costs, uh, reimb- and, and, and reform reimbursement. But one does want a, a mixed delivery a platform where the private uh, side plays an important role on the delivery side. And public services also need strengthening, quality improvements, better matching of budgets to performance. So there are a lot of pros to these reforms, but there's a lot of uh, uncertainties and issues which uh, um, uh, Gitesh has spoken to, the lengthy delays because of the, the, the kind of quite controversial nature of some of the reforms. It's led to very, very lengthy delays and quite a lot of cynicism around the implementation, just because this has been dragging on for so many years. There are very polarized views with little sense of compromise and legal challenge, even at present and and, and almost certainly more to come. Now, there are uncertainties in the bill. For example, will the health functions be split between the spheres? If you read the version of the the B bill that the Portfolio Committee put out last week, you'll see it says that Tertiary hospitals like Krutuskir become national government components. Districts become national government components. But uh, provincial hospitals like Victoria or Somerset potentially stay under the province. So are the health functions going to be split between the spheres? 
The bill says that further legislation will be needed once this bill is passed to finalize some of the shifts of functions between the spheres. How will this shift of functions between the spheres be handled? It's very complicated. Now, NHI is probably our best hope for substantially improving revenue raising for public health services over time or health in general. But there are many obstacles, including just practically from the Treasury, we've seen very slow progress with things like strategic purchasing for GPs and other services. And the NHI model that's been selected in South Africa, it's not that NHI is, 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 is wrong. NHI is and UHC are right, but the model that's been selected is quite difficult to implement because of partly because of what some is called path dependency, because in our kind of provincial system, countries like Canada and Australia have, have federalized funds. And with our very extensive medical schemes, countries like Germany and um, quite a number of the European countries have, have multiple fund systems. So to move away from these models, away from the provinces and away from the medical schemes, is a, it, it, it's not that it's wrong, but because of path dependency, it's, it's very difficult to do. So it's quite challenging to do. Uh, we did write a chapter about this. It's in the South African Health Review in 2019, if people want to read more about it. Now, just a bit about taxes. So this is a this was a, a small estimate we, we put out a few years back, but just for some of the early phases where we would need about 30 billion, 50 billion, 70 billion to raise for some of the early steps for NHI. And then the Treasury showed what would be needed then to fund just those early phases. And it might be a payroll tax of 3% of of one salary plus a one percent increase in VAT, or two and a half percent in as a surcharge on taxable income, or certain other combinations. So, you know, the various ways one can fund it. But you can see you can't do national health insurance without substantially raising taxes um, um, or putting in place mandatory contributions. In Germany, for example, I mean the mandatory contributions are about fifteen percent of every individual's income. But I mean, that's, this is just for the, the, the initial phases of NHI. A fully fledged NHI would cost much more. And uh, one estimate actually from the SHIELD project, which UCT was involved with uh, and, and helped to uh, and led, um, shows public expenditure going from about four to six and a half percent of GDP, could ultimately go to eight percent of GDP. So that's probably at least 100 to 150 billion that would, um, per, per year that would that would need ultimately to be found. So some, I'm coming towards the end now. Um, so some steps around NHI to watch. So the NHI bill got, got to go to the National Assembly and then to the NCOP. Um, and, and then even if the bill is passed with the subsequent legislation that will shift functions between the spheres, to what extent can more social consensus be built? Because otherwise, there's risks of endless um, delays and legal challenges. How the functions of the spheres are going to change, the establishment of the NHI fund, which is a big part of the bill, and what share of the health funding is going to start being directed through the new fund? How will strategic purchasing evolve, both in the public sector and also with private providers? To what extent will there be a mixed service platform like contracting with GPs. From the Treasury side, we've been trying to fund and pilot contracting with private GPs for some years. The Department of Health has not moved on this hardly at all. Uh, to what extent will the status of public institutions like public hospitals change? Will they become semi-independent so they can contract or will they not? Uh, because how do you contract? How does a fund contract with a hospital if it does not have some kind of semi-independent status? And what revenue sources will be put in place? What magnitude and when? Now, I do need to point out here that money bills are a minister of finance function. So all the revenue functions here can't come from the health department. They can only come from the minister of finance. So this is just the last slide by conclusion, is that public health funding is currently under substantial pressure. The funding of the 23 wage agreement needs to be resolved as soon as possible. The Health Portfolio Committee has just not given the nod to the NHI bill, but how long is the rest of the legislative process going to take? Is it possible to build more consensus or compromise or risk, or are we going to risk endless delays and legal challenges? There are many interim reforms which would be very helpful to build public trust. Like, as I said, we've been trying to 
to, for example, get the health department to be start contracting private GPs. Like if you could contract a thousand private GPs and people could see the fund, the emerging kind of fund is, you know, you can use your own GPs, etc. So it's important to show real progress and improvement in services, not just talk. Um, the revenue raising aspects are not straightforward given the economic, fiscal and spending pressures. We do need to build a more equitable UHC health financing system, but there may well be modifications in the proposals as they practically evolve in real life. Back to you, uh, Chairperson. You're muted, Sue. Sorry. Thanks so much, Mark. I was just saying that it's been many years that you have assisted us by presenting to our diploma students, and we really appreciate your inputs and the wisdom that you have shared, drawn from probably 30 years of working for National Treasury. So our next speaker is um, Dr. Engelbrecht. Beth, are you there? Yes, I am here. Thank you. Are you able to share on your side or you'd like me to do it? Uh, I'm trying to find. Um, not sure whether that's sharing or not. Not yet. Not yet. OK, I'm putting share. Um, and then he doesn't want to share. At all. Yeah. I can do it. OK, if you don't mind, it seems like I'm not, uh, it seems like it's not activating. Oh, there it goes, perhaps. Uh, my computer. No, no, it seems like it's not sharing. OK, I'm going to share my window. Online colleagues, can you see that? Can you yes, see that? Yes, yes, I can. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Sue. Um, I appreciate that. Okay, I'm going to put you there and close that like that. Okay. Now we're able Good. to see you and the screen, and I'm going to mute myself. Thank you so much, Beth. Over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sue. And I really want to commend you for putting this mini symposium together. It's very timely. Um, and you've, the esteemed colleagues that spoke before me um, are impressive. So thank you very much uh, for that. So the topic um, I was focusing, that I was given to focus on is um, understanding the role of NHI on the pathway to UHC, but then the health system governance for, for NHI. Um, I then explored the NHI bill to see to what extent I can get guidance on health system governance matters in the bill. But I think the previous speaker spoke about the limitations in the bill um, when it comes to the health system. Um, the only reference was that the, the National Minister of Health uh, will be, will be uh, the kind of the political head of both uh, the provider arm uh, of health and also the purchaser arm of health um, in, in, in being the, the where, where both these functions are at one place. I then decided to rather focus on UHC uh, because that is what the purpose of NHI is in any case. So I've got a few discussion points, just briefly a case for change. I'm sure I don't have to make the case for change, uh, but let me just roughly uh, touch on that. Um, the issue of the centrality of leadership and governance, um, what is smart governance and how do we co-produce health um, and how do we build a learning health system and then just a few uh, concluding thoughts. Thank you. So um, on the case for change, so th this this image on the front page of the Times some time ago um, reflected the reality of our country of the world's most un unequal country. Um, and it, it's no surprise that there were so many comments made to the bill because health is a matter of social justice, is a matter of human rights. But to rectify the image on the right um, is not only a health problem. It is a government and a country problem. Um, and that is where we need to, to see how do, we, how do we as a country move in that direction. The next slide then talks about what are the symptoms of this inequity. Sorry, yeah, that one. So there's a health equity gap. 
um, on the left bar, you've got the percentage share of benefit. And if you take the top uh, blue one is the uh, richest 20% of the population. And the very bottom blue one is the poorest 20% of the population. And you can see wh what is the share of need. So, so the, the share of benefit uh, that the, the poorest uh, receives is uh, very small compared to what the need is. And that inequity is what we wish to achieve through universal health coverage. The next slide, and I'm very glad that Chris is in the, in the audience. Uh, you would recognize this slide. He was the author and the designer thereof. Um, I don't think I can move it. Yes. So, um, so this is just where do we locate interventions? So on the left hand side, uh, we've got the kind of the dysfunctional health system speaking to the public sector. The percentages are slightly different uh, than what uh, Gitesh has mentioned, but it boils to the same thing. That you've got half, half of the GDP for uh, 84, I think is now 88% of the population and the private sector, the percentage is there. But if you understand the consequences of what's happening in the public sector, these are the symptoms that we see on the media, in the news, wherever, and when, when patients visit facilities, they experience poor quality of care. If one analyzes it and unpack it, the root causes thereof are the seven aspects that, that's listed there. First is poor leadership and management. The second one, weak governance and accountability. The third one, political interference. Um, and if you take the top three together, it is absolutely a leadership and governance issue for the, the, the argument for the poor quality of care. Now, obviously, Mark spoke, spoke about the inadequate but also reducing resources, putting the systems under tremendous pressure despite population increases, despite increases in burden of disease. Um, so, but if you then move to the private sector, uh, and the main issue there is unsustainable cost escalations. Um, so there's market concentration and there's perverse incentives. And uh, there was a health market inquiry um, that and the report was tabled in 2019 already. Um, and one gets the impression that the private sector is blamed for everything that goes wrong. But it's a, it's a governance issue. We need to start implementing what is what the health market inquiry gave us, 47 recommendations, and start working on that sector whilst we're also working on the other. Then the further slide, uh, thanks, um, uh, Sue. The further slide thing is, oh, sorry, the, the, that, that slide was actually then to say that financing reform, like the NHI, is not the only solution. The centrality of leadership and governance is what we need to consider. And if we look at what the WHO already recommended uh, in 2000 and 2007, is uh, if you analyze health systems, you you have the kind of the six building blocks that they've referred to, um, and uh, service delivery, health workforce, information, medical project. At the bottom two is financing and leadership and governance. And they then take you to access, and Sue, you, you, you explained this uh, very well in terms of a different packaging of this model. If you look at to the far right, you can see that this was a further development in the WHO to say, but let us put leadership and governance at the center. Unless you get um, the, 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 um, the, the leadership and governance right, the other aspects of the of the building blocks will not come in place. So that is the glue that will bring things together. And a lot of the complaints we have is medication is not available, there's not enough staff or whatever the case might be. The further slide then um, uh, goes to say, but okay, how do we define governance? We say it's central, it's important, it's uh, essential, um, and but, but how do we define that? So you can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is one uh, definition by Graham. Uh, so governance is how government and other social organizations interact, how they relate to citizens and how they take decisions. I think it's a very nice, they're long definitions, but I thought that one is the most compact. But if you then look at health systems governance, is there a difference? How does that work? And what's important here, you've got three major players in that governance framework. You've got people, you've got policymakers, and you've got um, the providers. 
and they are uh, kind of uh, gears that link all of them together. And if one unpack that a bit, uh, Big Daily then also went further to say that, but who are the, just go back one, what, who are the actors and who are the principals in these relationships? And they came to the conclusion that the people are the principals and the policymakers are the actors. They have to act on what the, the principals would like to have, the people. The people are also the ones that demand from the providers particular care. And the policymakers obviously are the principles of the providers. So if you are people, you're always a principal. If you're a provider, you're always an agent. And I think that very often talks about why there's so much blaming on, on the providers. But also if the people would like to have things to improve, in general, they have to go via the long route through the policymakers to bring improvement. But understanding how these gears connect and how the people are, who are different interest groups, how they connect to this governance framework helps us to understand what needs to happen to move the system forward towards improved health. The next slide then talks about smart governance, um, of uh, which is talking about co-production of health. And I think the principle here is health is not cre health is created outside of health. Health is not necessarily created inside the health system. And this, this analysis, um, uh, you can go one, talks about uh, governance of health and governance for health. So this was from Kickbush and Gleicher in 2012 already, where they put, say they said, there's a co-production of health inequity. So on the left hand side, you've got governance for health, which is shared governance of the social determinants of health. So it is not only health's problem, um, you also need a good education system, you need good roads, you need good safety and security, you need good water and sanitation, you need a, a lot of aspects that's outside of health to be able to improve health. Um, thanks, Sue. Um, and if you look to the right hand side, there is the governance of health. That is where the health system is being governed. How do you strengthen your health system? And they refer to that as shared care. How can patients and professionals work together to improve health? And ultimately, if you those put those two together, you ultimately get co-production of health um, and equity. If you go a further slide, uh, Sue, it just gives a bit of uh, explanation on that. So the governance for health is joint actions across health and non-health actors, as well as citizens, and to the right-hand side is strengthening the systems. And smart governance is where you bring them together. So to achieve smart governance, there's kind of a few overlapping aspects that you can look at. So you govern by collaborating, um, or you by engaging citizens, or you govern by mixing regulation and persuasion, look at multi-stakeholder groupings to be able to, to give effect to, to improved health. Or you can have independent agencies and expert bodies, and ultimately, you know, are your, your policies adaptive? Do you have resilient structures and do you have information um, to be able to have foresight in the system to prepare well for pandemics and whatever the case might be? So smart governance of health is a very fundamental aspect where you want to co-produce health. Just a further slide then talks about very often we use the term collaboration. Um, and this is just an analysis of what is the kind of the continuum by which uh, collaboration happened. It seems like the slide is not moving, Sue, unless I'm missing it. Yes. Um, so there is a collaboration continuum. So kind of from immuring or just co-locating to networking where you exchange information or you coordinate or you cooperate. And when you come to collaboration, it is really learning from each other to enhance each other's capacity until you get to the point of integration. So very often we say, yes, all the sectors must, must collaborate to improve health, but collaboration is a very intense and complex process. And I would like to touch on that a bit further on. So the next part of the presentation is just our current uh, landscape um, of governance uh, in, in, in the country. So the next slide, I'm building it from the bottom up. Um, so the next slide is a sub-district um, in, in, in South Africa. Uh, so the sub-district where you have local governance and local innovation, and they are really the dynamic 
ent entities in, in our health system. So you can see here, uh, you've got a district hospital connected and kind of have an interconnection with primary health care facilities, with community health worker teams, school health services, etc. And the district hospital is connected to intermediate care, to specialized hospitals, to regional hospitals, and, and, and then the private entities are in that as well. So the sub-district is the build, the basis of our system. Now, obviously, there are more than one sub-district, sub and they are then in one district, and we call that a district health system. So the next slide then talks about um, how does, where does the district office, so the district office is then responsible for uh, a few of the sub-districts. And obviously, all of that is connected to civil society and business and sector. So this is a very busy entity, a lot of relationships, a lot of complexities, a lot of power issues in this small space. The next slide then builds the system higher up. So uh, this slide is from a document that Lucy and I crafted for the, um, the health sector reform book. Um, and if you take it from the bottom up, you've got a public and civil society actors, you've got the frontline manager, you've got the district and the sub-district officers, provincial department, nationals, kind of it looks very nice and neat. So this was designed from a district perspective. If one then look at the, the flow of arrows and the, the thickness of the arrows, where does the power come from? So the power is from the national department to the province and from the province to the district, and then it dissipates um, across um, all, the, all the service entities, hospitals, clinics, ambulances, and all of those things. If you look to the left, um, as part of the governance framework in this country, uh, there's political and oversight actors. So clearly we've consolidated that in one box, but there's a lot there in the national department, your national cabinet, your parliament, your your Auditor General, your, um, your Human Rights Commission, your your health, you know, it, a, a, lot is, a lot is in that, all your Schedule 9 bodies, um, etc. And they penetrate quite deep into the provinces. And at the provincial level, you also have a provincial cabinet, the provincial uh, pot, uh, parliamentary portfolio committees, uh, you've got the provincial cabinet, you've got uh, provincial departments, uh, etc. And they obviously have got at the local level, you're in your municipalities, you also have political and oversight actors. If you go to the right, the other government actors. So at the national level, you've got all the other departments, all the other sectors. At the provincial level, uh, there are 13 sectors um, in, in, in kind of at the provincial level under the, the leadership of the premiers and the, the MECs and the provincial cabinet. And that is a space where there's intersectoral work happening. That is where the potential lie for co-creating health um, at that level, because that's where you build relationships, etc. And that then opens the door for what the district office could connect to the other sectors, to education. We've got school health services. You can't render that without having a relationship with the schools, et cetera. But at that provincial level, that is where um, th those connections take place. If you go to the, the next slide, um, and this is really just kind of my understanding of, of trying to make sense of what I read in the NHI bill. So at the national level, the NHI fund will be alongside the National Department of Health, but the functions of the National Department of Health is um, not explicit whether they are going to change given uh, the new relationship. And then definitely the National Department's relationship with the province or the district, how will that change? You can also see the thickness of the arrows from the National Department to the province uh, is, is thinner, and the Provincial, the pursue already spoke to that. Will there be a provincial department? At the moment, it seems like there is an attempt to to hollow out provinces from their their money, the 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 resources that they have, irrespective of the fact that they are, you know, where they are positioned and that they've got kind of a, a, a system going, um, and that that then is being taken to where the new red arrows are in terms of the power relationships. Provinces seems to be they may be appointed as management agents. They may be responsible for quality. Um, and very often one asks the question, how can you be responsible for quality, but not responsible for people and uh, funds, etc. Kind of, so I think there are many questions. I think I can augment a series of a list of questions to that. 
the NHI fund will directly engage with uh, the CUPS, which are more or less at the sub-district level, um, and they will d directly engage with private hospitals. I've added it's about 600 entities that will report directly to the NHI fund if there is not another structure uh, in between. Um, you will see there but at service entities also kind of the, the, the this dotted arrow there um, in terms of the central hospitals. Uh, so just to point out that very often in the general public's eyes, a central hospital is this facility that render, renders purely tertiary and quaternary services, which is not the case. They, they, the big chunk of those hospitals is part of the, 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 the regional platform of care in a, in a province, um, and they are kind of part thereof, and they then buffer the tertiary level. So if it should happen that these central hospitals would go to national, you will fragment um, kind of the, the, the platform of care. And I often put myself in the position of a patient with a complaint at Grotteskir Hospital. Where do I go to now with my complaint? I can't go to the MEC, I can't go to the Premier, I must go to the fund or to the minister, etc. So I think there's a lot of issues that must be understood. And, and I also recall that we uh, had a kind of Ian Mann, which is a management consultant, uh, came to sit with us at the stage. And he visited, uh, uh, I think it was Grotesky Rastral, just to have an understanding before he engaged with us on management issues. And he said, That's, <laughs> a central hospital is the most complex organization that he has ever encountered. And that is from a person who consults with uh, lots of big private companies. But let me, I'm digressing, let me go on. Um, the, uh, if one, this is a very nice uh, book um, of going universal, how 24 developing countries are implementing UHC. And I think uh, from the bottom, a very nice document. And one of the quotes um, in this book is managing a health system is one of the most complex activities governments can take on. And I think just the previous speakers just the range, the range of issues there um, are, are, are demonstrating that. I would like to go on just a few examples of learnings in terms of co-production for health. And uh, really, I'll just go quick over them. Um, the first one is in KwaZulu-Natal, the Sukumasaki um, initiative. It's a stand up and build. So it's an example of multi-sectoral, multi-level governance. It originated in 2009 as a SANEC prescript for currently having provincial and district HIV and AIDS councils. And over time, they expanded uh, the council's responsibilities to also address various social determinants as well as ultimately COVID. So what they have is ward-based war rooms authorized and overseen by the provincial cabinet chaired by ward councillors, and then they've got field workers who conduct home visits and register challenges, and they've got COCTA appointed war room administrators. So the political leaders would identify problems, and the officials have to address that um, and give feedback every two weeks. So there's a lot of learnings, and I've just listed a few. Firstly, from the community perspective, they feel they are connected, there's a place where they can be heard, there's rapid recognition of challenges, and there's very often resolution. The challenges uh, that they've experienced in this model is that if there's a change in politicians, then the system, there's a hiatus. And there's also uh, uh, continuity of officials is a concern. And it formed a parallel structure, for example, to the District Health Council. And a lot of reporting burden. Every two weeks you have to give feedback. Um, and health being one of the, you know, one of the largest departments, they, they are the ones that have to kind of have the most of the feedback. And there was also an imbalance between reactive work and system strengthening work to address root causes. So ultimately, it was it was like a, a very binary approach, but you couldn't get to the root causes um, of the system. And then the capacity of the ward councillors are uneven. The further example I would like to share is a Western Cape example of our society approach, where uh, the municipality um, uh, as we know, the municipalities must have an in integrated development plan. So all the 13 departments at the provincial level then look, um, get together within a particular municipality and say, how can we as a collective uh, change the story of the lives of people? And here was the Carolyn Lindy story. Um, and we look at the, the life course approach. 
uh, between 0 and 18, uh, the providers 18 to 60, and then the whys. How do we connect with communities to change the life storage and ultimately improve health and well-being? So there were four learning sites, and the one learning site focused on early childhood development and first thousand days, one of them focused on kind of violence um, and one on infrastructure. So there was a lot of learnings over these four learning sites. Um, the next slide then is just to talk about the type of governance arrangements that was necessary to get this going. Um, so this Hello Society approach was part of the provincial strategic plan. Um, the extended cabinet, which is both cabinet plus the municipalities, have oversight over the, the, the strategic plan. Uh, there were macro, meso and micro levels of governance. There were multi-space governance at the local place, horizontally, collaboratively at both meso and macro uh, um, and at micro, as well as vertical departmental governance. So to, to have co-creation of health is quite an involved process. And I think the earlier um, point out of what does collaboration mean just just talk about the complexity what we're dealing with and health ultimately requires these type of interactions to support municipalities and to work together. The next slide then um, um, is about prioritizing people um, and rapid learning. This was an initiative across three provinces during COVID to say that how do we value healthcare workers? Uh, they were experiencing burnout that was compounded with COVID. Um, and ultimately, it was learning partnerships that was that was established, the virtual learning partnerships, multi-level, multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder, to see to what extent can we support healthcare workers um, in this process and how can we establish learning cycles in this. And we also found that there's an interdependence between leadership, learning and improvement. The next slide then talks about, uh, yeah, this was just a collaborative learning design that we had kind of a virtual big sessions and then small focus group sessions to, to, to kind of network uh, the learnings across the province. The next slide um, is, a, is, I'm not going to talk about that one, that's COVID. Um, it was a multi-sectoral uh, process. So let us then go to building a learning health system, which is a particular governance lever to be able to, to govern for health. Um, and so the first slide then is to how do we generate knowledge for learning? And this comes from the WHO <coughs> Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, um, where they talk about how do we, um, how does learning occur um, and how do you create conditions for learning? So a lot of these things sound like, you know, it's it's kind of, it's relational, it's hard work, it's a learning system, it's learning networks, get people around the table, reflect on stuff. But ultimately it is these, the attention to these softer side of skills that ultimately will improve the system and lead um, and take it forward. The next slide, um, then talks about uh, if you want to generate knowledge for change, what could be the benefit of these learning health systems? So to, to the left, you can see the, um, the way that learning happens. It's learning loop, single loop, double loop, triple loop. It's kind of ultimately where, how do you combine information with deliberation and action to have deep learning of what does the system need to change? Very often people think if you receive a uh, a policy from national, uh, then voila, it's going to happen. It's not the case. It's a lot of, uh, 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 we, you know, people say health is a complex adaptive system because of the complexity, because of all the issues that so you need to have a systematic approach to change the system. So ultimately, if you do look to the right of uh, the, the table, the on key change, it is the increased ability for continuous learning. So how do we ultimately create a mechanism by which there's increased um, ability? You know, in, in our health system across the country, there's a lot of fear. And the Auditor General is kind of part there of the fear of the Auditor General. So people will not try to make a mistake. They will not innovate. They will not do anything because they are fearful of the Auditor General. And ultimately, you can't self-renew and improve. Mark showed us the, the kind of the, the reducing budgets for provinces and for, for, for the whole country. 
So how do you get around that? You can't just sit back and close the door of your office. You have to find a way. And if you create learning circles of how do we do more with what we've got? How do we still maintain each other's motivation? How do we develop our leaders to be able to take the right decisions in the front? We're not going to get to self-renewal. The further slide then um, is just, I think, Oh, that is just means of learning what could be done. You've got there's so many places where we've we come together in any case. We've got M and E meetings, we've got orderly meetings, we've got workshops, and all of those lend itself for intentional and deliberate learning. And I think we need to change our mind shifts on what is required to get there. So just a few concluding thoughts um, on health systems governance for health. Um, so firstly, it is important to enhance the capability across the whole system. That includes national, that includes the whole system needs capability. Um, and we need to intensify that guided by the UHG, UHG governance and capability framework. Unless you know how you, how you see the UHC to be governed, um, and what are the type of capabilities you, you can't really get to the strengthening part, and that is a very important aspect. Grow people capabilities for significant complexity. We know, especially if you look at the image of when the NHI fund come in, all those red arrows, all the changes, it's going to add massive complexity. And at the moment, um, one is concerned that there's like a, people are holding their breath. NHI is going to bring the solutions to all. It's not. Nicholas Crisp said the other day it's going to take at least 10 years, and the other day he said it's going to take a few decades. So, so clearly we are in for a very difficult period. And what do we do in the meantime? I would like to, to link to what Kitesh also said. So let us grow people capabilities for this complexity, the capacity to adapt, to absorb, to transform. How does transformation work? How, how, do, you, how do you tackle that? How do you get from point A to point B? How do you have capabilities for respectful collaboration and partnerships? And ultimately, how do you get to uh, a continuous learning for, for self-renewal? And don't, you know, we should not wait for the national or wherever. This is something that can happen at every little space and we can circle that out. The last slide then um, talks about enhanced capability in the sub-district. Um, we need to build the system from the bottom up. We need to start from where we are. Um, and the sub-district and community-oriented primary care, that is the place we have to start working on now. Whilst they're sorting out the NHI, all the case, legal cases, all, let us be pragmatic and say, how do we make sure that we strengthen the system from the bottom up and make sure that we okay, demand so the type of support? Again? Yeah, how much we came back, yeah. Sorry, it's some, somebody's talking there. Uh, and then lastly, um, learn um, uh, in relationships, learn how to build multi-level, multi-sectoral uh, and community governance relationships. These things are not easy. They take hard work. Um, and ultimately, you can co-produce health and equity and dignity. We have not spoken about dignity, which is another human right. So I would like to conclude by to say there's, there's urgency for us not to double anymore and say that there's a health system that is waiting for us as leaders to step into. There's enough legal space now. There's enough willing partners. There's lots of excellent leaders and healthcare workers and pockets of excellence in the country. Why wait? Uh, the system is just waiting for, for leaders to, to say, let's, let's go forward. So, yeah, I think the last slide um, is just to, oh, yeah, that's just to say thank you. And then the very last one is just um, all the sources that you could go and read about uh, UHC. Um, and, you know, this is such a dynamic field. Health is such a, an amazing, an amazing um, sector and uh, amazing complexity uh, that all of us can work in. So there's, there are a few resources that people can tap into. Thank you very much. Thank you, Beth. That was really just such a such a huge amount of wisdom shared with us. And um, I am wondering if Michelle is with us online. Yeah. Hi, Michelle. How are you doing? Good. 
Good. <laughs> Would you like to share your slides or are you just going to? I've, I've got a whole bunch of them, but um, in the interest of time, let me just talk to the point quickly. Okay. Um, so reflecting on what everyone said, and, and I'm cheating because my slides are, don't deal with what everyone said. So um, I think the first thing that we need to, to look at is um, what can we do? Um, and I think starting the point, the starting point of the discussion is that we should not be distracted by the events surrounding the NHR bill. Um, the, the bill is just one part of the reforms that's required towards universal coverage. It's an important part, but it's just one of many. Um, the white paper itself outlines the policy reform and associated processes. So there's a lot that we can do um, as activists, as uh, health professionals, as analysts, as policymakers um, in, in moving towards UHC. So what are some of those things? And I'm going to pick on a few things that, that people have uh, addressed in, in, in the last two hours. Um, first one is legislative reform, and I'm going to list five things which I think are, are critically important that can still be done whilst we're trying to deal with um, uh, with the NHI bill and, and other things that are happening. Uh, one is a reform around professional associations. Um, those of you who are health professionals in, in the room will understand that there are certain things like uh, group practices, uh, alternative reimbursement uh, models, uh, scopes of practices that need to be amended to allow for multidisciplinary teams to be entrenched, especially within the private sector. So, so we currently have uh, uh, ethical rules within the Health Professionals Council, which prevents sharing of revenue. Um, now, how do you sh not share revenue in a capitation model or an integrated system? Um, so, so there's things that need to be done. Second is, um, Beth raised this issue, Mark raised this issue, um, the relationship with Central Hospital. Um, personal view, um, and, and this is not informed specifically by the discussions today, is that if Central Hospitals, or at least certain parts of Central Hospitals, were identified both in terms of the academic function, but also the uh, super specialist quaternary services, um, maybe there's a need to actually remove those from an NHI environment because they'll never meet certain criteria that you set for service benefits. Um, um, uh, separation of Siamese twins will never be something that will be cost effective in, in, in our healthcare system. Does it mean you don't do it or you don't reimburse the service? Um, the third area, which I think is fundamentally important, is the uh, regulatory uh, uh, um, framework around the Office of Health Standards and Compliance, specifically the issue around quality standards. Um, if we want to start improving the way in which we deliver services and how people perceive those services, then we need to start moving towards a, a, a framework that everyone understands. And, and that doesn't require the NHI bill uh, to take place. It, it requires a regulatory framework uh, led by the Office of Health Standards and Compliance. Um, the fourth area is that of improved and expanded platform to train health professionals. Um, we've seen multiple issues uh, around doctors, interns, specialists, registrars, community service doctors, you can name them. There's, there's a whole bunch of them that, that, that we're struggling with. Um, there was a nurses protest earlier or late last week. Um, it all lends to, to these issues around whether we have enough health professionals, how do we improve and expand the platform to do so, how do we integrate um, and use available resources. And the first one I'm going to talk about is the Medical Schemes Act because it's something that, that needs to be done. Um, we need to improve the access and, and, and ability to provide a common uh, benefits uh, structure. It's important to recognize that even if NHI takes two years, five years, 10 years, um, you can't sit back and do nothing. So there's always been an approach that, you know, the private sector is not the biggest priority, we, or at least medical schemes are not the biggest priority. So we don't have to do anything about it. Um, we're going to uh, change the way in which they work, so <clears throat> let's uh, uh, let's leave that as is. But but I think we we can't actually do that. Um, that's one issue, leadership governance. Second one is governance and leadership. Beth has pointed out some of the of the very 
interesting and important issues that we need to consider, uh, especially around uh, um, governance and leadership. I, I think that the NHI bill, do you need a NHI bill to improve the governance of our facilities? Do you need an NHI bill to improve the governance of our public health sector? I think we know the answer to the question. Um, governance and, and management and administrative oversight is important, but the one area I think Beth, that that we need to focus a lot more on is clinical governance. And and it's important to understand that um, clinical governance is important for access to quality health services. That's the under, that's the first paragraph of the of the of the white paper. It talks about improving access to quality health services. I'm going to say something and, and uh, forgive me for the, for the repeating it. Um, it's not an overnight process. Right? It's a process that requires uh, time and behavior change. If we look at our C-section rates and, 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 and antibiotic usage, whether you're in the public sector or in the private sector, we know that we're not doing great. Um, we need to do something about it. Professionals in both the public sector and the private sector provide care differently. And again, we, 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 we can't be naive about this. They do so because of different circumstances before them. In some cases, it's either because of lack of resources, and in other cases, it's because of too much of resources. But ultimately, if everyone should be able to access the same minimum standard of care, then we need to be more critical of the way in which we, we address uh, the clinical governance issues. The issues around uh, improving our understanding, uh, Sue, you raised this point, right? Improving our understanding and need of, of, of health care. Um, the National Health Department has made extensive inroads in, in the area around the HPRS, the Health, Profe uh, health Professional um, Health Patient uh, Registry, um, the Health Professional Registration Number. We've seen this in, 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 in work through the EVDS system. Um, some of you will say it worked, some of you will say it didn't work. At the end of the day, we went on to the internet, um, we put in details, we registered, we got sent a notification of where to go um, to get our vaccine. It, there's something there that worked and, and we need to build on that part of it. But more than just a registration system, we need to understand the needs of people. Everyone who interacts with a health professional must be registered in the system. We need to start to understand the health seeking behavior so that we can build capitation models, we can build DRG systems, um, and we need to start being granular in our data. Uh, on utilization of the per patient level. So if you're going to build a capitation model, you need to start with uh, an iterative process, register the people, step one. You can do desktop exercises to understand the flows of money. But step two is collecting data, and, and we're going to have to build up a, a history of, of, of a patient um, and understand what their needs are, not just geographically, but also in terms of what services they use. Again, you can do a, a desktop exercise of risk profiling, but it's a, it's a little process. It, it, it takes us to a third step, which is we adjust the models for need and risk. Um, so we can design district-based uh, uh, utilization frameworks for, for reimbursement, but it requires us to build really good, robust systems around information uh, around health-seeking behavior. Again, it's going to take a few years, but it doesn't mean you start later because it's going to take a few years. If we start now, again, do we need a bill to uh, an NHR bill to, to do this? No, we can start immediately. So a need for a central reporting system for utilization is necessary. The next area is minimum standards. Now, I raised this with the, with the earlier point around the Office of Health Standards and Compliance, but um, one area where government will be challenged um, if they don't address this adequately, is the need for uh, common service delivery standards that applies both to the public and the private sector. If you start having exemptions or, or different frameworks for how, how that is measured, then you're going to have an impact on, on people will sue you, but also you're going to have an impact on service delivery standards and quality. Um, health service of the future, as the white paper says, it does not distinguish between the public sector and the private sector. It says that any accredited provider must be able to do something. Right? So, so we shouldn't focus on whether it's a public clinic or, or a private GP. It needs to be a common system. Um, also, um, we need to do more 
than the minimum standard that is encouraged. But it shouldn't come at the cost or expense of another person that won't get access. So we shouldn't factor, we shouldn't prioritize access and 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 the extent to which they get services if they don't get uh, access and and it, or it limits the access to someone else. So there's a there's a personal cost and a, and a payment issue that's required to to be addressed. Um, the 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 next point is, do we have enough money? Um, I'm going to defer. I'm going to deviate and defer with Mark on this one. Um, and and I think Gitesh did a very simple uh, analogy of of risk pooling or, or, or pooling. Um, I think we do have enough money. Um, we need to understand the redistributive effects and how best to leverage this in the short, medium, and long term. And 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 in doing so, we need to understand that it's not just about redistributing revenue and budgets. But it's also about influencing expenditure. Right, so we need to we need to change the way in which we spend money uh, on healthcare services uh, to get the desired outcome. Now, again, the question that we need to understand is what do we spend money on, and is it appropriate? And, and I don't think um, I don't think we have had enough uh, uh, understanding whether that's research or whether it's analytics around uh, on what do we spend money and is it appropriate. Um, the white paper and UN and UHC talk about uh, 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 pooling, right? On one side, you got risk pooling, on the other side, you got pooling of funds. Again, not an overnight process, but we 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 can start doing some things. We don't need to wait uh, um, for the NHL bill to start some of those things. Um, legislative reform, again, um, again, I'm going back to legislative reform, but legislative reform specifically around. Uh, not the public sector. So let me be clear about that and what that means. If we're going to move from a combination of a, a voluntary contributory health insurance system and a tax funded public sector in terms of provision to a single contributory model, um, that needs work. That doesn't all happen overnight. I mean, we're not going to go to sleep and wake up on the 1st of April sometime in the future and it's going to be there, right? It, it, it requires us to do a lot of things. So what do we do? I think we we need to start processes um, um, between health, treasury, uh, academics, uh, other individuals around understanding virtual pooling, and how can we build systems whereby um, monies can be effectively uh, pooled in a virtual environment uh, and redistributed to understand what the risks are, uh, what the negative and what the positive implications will be of such processes. It, what is not useful? What is not useful, and it comes to my last point soon, and I promise it's the last point, um, is the distinction between medical schemes, health insurance, and insurance. Um, there's a big difference between how each of those uh, components work, and we shouldn't take a broad brush approach to saying it's the private sector. Uh, what is not useful also is to allow proliferation of inappropriate and inadequate insurance products. Um, product people, people think that they are buying something only to pitch up at hospitals or certain providers and realize they don't have any cover. Um, why? Because there's a regulatory, regulatory gap. We don't have uh, 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 the regulations around low cost benefit options, but let's leave low cost benefit options out of the equation. Let's look at the issue around uh, people in a contributory model and making sure that they have adequate services. Um, I'm, I'm going to say this and it's probably not going to be really nicely accepted, but let me say it anyway. Um, we have a lot of very intelligent people in South Africa. People who are experts in solving problems. However, if you allow them to design products in the absence of a proper regulatory framework, we are asking for trouble. And ultimately, that is going to undermine UHC. Because once we get to that point, we're going to understand that it's very difficult to reverse it. So again, whilst it might not be highest on people's agenda in terms of the medical schemes environment, it can seriously undermine the, the ability to implement UHC if we don't deal with this uh, distinction between private uh, uh, health insurance, health insurance, medical schemes, insurance products, and I, I, again, I want to say something that we should not be influenced by rhetoric. 
there's a lot of statements and, and information in, that's been contained, whether it's in media or in different platforms. Bottom line, if you're in the public sector and you are dependent on care in the public sector, let's be honest, it does not provide all the services it's supposed to. And if you're in the private sector, not all the services you get are paid for. So the argument that NHI is taking away services from those who can pay and or asking people to pay for what they used to get free, it's not a real argument. Um, if that was the case, medical scheme beneficiaries would get all the services they need without co-payments or balance billing, and the public sector patients would not be sent home without meds or wait three months for a CT scan. So in short, we do need a, a, a process of dealing with pooling. Uh, Mark, I don't think that in the short term we need to necessarily increase taxes or introduce new taxes. Um, but I do think that we need to find a, a, a way of, of, of integrating contributory structures uh, and getting people to, to, to pay for their health care in a different way. Yes, there are perverse incentives, but it does not mean that you do not do it. It means that you address the perverse incentive. So let me stop there. Um, I, I hope I've raised enough um, interesting comments for you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vishal. Um, Vishal is joining us from India at the moment, so we're really grateful for taking the time. It's night there, I would imagine. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time. Now, it's my fault. I invited, was it in addition to me, four amazing speakers <laughs> and asked them to, to yeah. So it's my fault. So unfortunately, um, we are now two minutes past four. But the good news is that we fully set up for our um, meet and greet event upstairs and everybody is encouraged and invited to come to that. And at least me and Gitesh will be there to ask questions. Um, if there's anything burning in the room or online or a comment that anybody would like to make, but otherwise pop upstairs and we can have a chat up there. And thank you so much to everybody for attending and for your attention and thank you to the online audience as well. I'm hoping that we will have more of these conversations in the future and uh, I think that this is a, a fantastic start. So thanks Michelle, hope to see you again soon.